excited to introduce our next speaker, Laura Bissell, who will be doing a talk entitled People, Polemics, and Play, the Performance of Politics in the Independence Referendum. Dr. Laura Bissell is a lecturer in contemporary performance practice at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Uh, she is a visiting lecturer on the MRES in Creative Practices program at Glasgow School of Art and has taught on the Trans Art Institute MFA in Berlin. Laura is an associate editor of the Theatre, Dance and Performance Training Journal and has been on the board of a Moments Peace Theatre Company since 2011. She has recently co-authored an article for Contemporary Theatre Review entitled Early Days, Reflections on the Performance of a Referendum with Dr. David Oberend and created an accompanying doc documentary video, which I believe we featured on our website, if that's correct, yeah, uh, so you can check that out there. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Bissell. Hello everyone and many thanks to Sarah and Katie for inviting me to speak today. So as uh, mentioned, I'm a lecturer in contemporary performance practice. Um, I consider it an important privilege to work in education and particularly to teach on a programme that has socially engaged practice at its heart and which encourages artists to be active citizens in the world. As well as being a a lecturer, I'm also a performance researcher and writer, and like many other people in Scotland, I could not help but be drawn in by uh, the extraordinary events in the lead up to the referendum last year. There are lots of things I could talk about today, but I'm going to stick with what I know, performance, um, and I'm going to talk about my perception of the role that performance played in the independence debate. So I've called this paper People, Polemics and Play, and it reflects on how the independence debate has informed and politicised performance making and creative participation in politics since the historic vote on September 18. My collaborator David Overend and I wrote an article, uh, as mentioned, as part of a special electoral theatre edition um, of the journal that came out in May. So I refer to some of the ideas that we talk about in this article um, and some of the early ideas were um, were published on the, as an article on the National Collective website as well. So I'm also really interested in analysing whether the liveness of contemporary performance lends itself particularly well to interrogating political moments. So I'm going to start with some ideas that I use with my first year students when I begin to look at feminisms and gender in our critical and contextual studies class. Alan Reich and Alexander Moffat, in their excellent book, Arts of Independence, say that teaching is asking questions, and I'm very much of this school of thought also. I ask a lot of questions, and I encourage students to ask why all of the time, of themselves, of the work they're making, of the world. So these particular questions that I offer them are posed by performance theorist Ellen Diamond in Unmaking Mimesis. She's asking these particular questions in the context of women in theatre and performance, but I find these questions really useful to consider in relation to lots of parts of our society. She asks, who is speaking and who is listening? Whose body is in view and whose is not? What is being represented, how and with what effects? Who or what is in control? So we could ask these questions of many aspects of our society. We could ask them of our political system, we could ask them of our judicial system, we could ask them of our media, and, and many other things. We can also ask these questions of the performance of the referendum, as this political event provoked many people to respond to a feeling of a lack of representation, and to try to make their voices, their bodies, and their opinions more visible. Not all, of course, and there were still many people and communities who were underrepresented. But people played a huge part in the referendum campaign, and the grassroots political movement where people began to enact their politics was happening all over Scotland. And this, um, this kind of ties into the lady's, um, the lady's final comment in the panel session there, actually. Um, after all, as Jane Harvey points out, National identities are neither biologically nor territorially given. Rather, they are creatively produced or staged. I'm therefore interested in the variety of ways that the independence was staged 
The independence debate was staged or performed in 2014. The demonstration of political action, of people taking to the streets, felt new, it felt energising, but has historical precedents much further back. Performance theorists Leslie Hill and Helen Paris in their article The Suffragettes Invented Performance Art argue that the movement for female suffrage at the start of the 20th century is an example of political action being publicly performed. They cite how on uh, the 17th of June 1911, 40,000 women marched in a spectacular and theatrically executed procession seven, mile lo seven miles long. And actually, um, Rebecca Solnit also talks in her book Wanderlust, which is uh, a history of walking, about the city streets as, a, as sites for political marches and demonstrations. So the suffragettes marches won over a lot of public support, but when the reform bill was rejected in 1912, they began diversifying their performances of political action. They burned feminist slogans onto golf courses with acid, they burned cricket pavilions and tea rooms, and they set pillar boxes alight. Hill says, one might argue that these were acts of terrorism rather than performance, but no one can dissuade me from thinking that the scores of fashionable ladies who synchronised their wristwatches made their way to the select shopping districts of Oxford Street, Knightsbridge and Kensington and demurely pr produced hammers from dainty handbags which with, with, with which they decorously smashed exclusive windows were not exquisite performers with absolute performance awareness and control, perfectly marrying the form and content of their work. In this article, Helen Paris argued that the way in which women were using their bodies as sites of oppression and resistance, employing guerrilla tactics and public demonstration to work against the status quo and use their live presence to perform personal truths and opinions was one of the first instances of politics being actively performed in the public sphere. So this is not a million miles away from how people were performing their politics during the referendum campaign. And I'll return to this idea in a moment. So I've started to think a little bit about people and I want to move on to talk a little bit about polemic. On the 5th of August, then Scottish First Minister Alex Salmond and leader of the Better Together campaign, Alistair Darling, stood on the Athenaeum stage of the Royal Conservatory of Scotland, this is where I work, in front of a studio audience of 350 yes, no and undecided voters. Using the RCS stage as the site for this televised debate meant that the drama of the political dispute was seemingly, without irony, located in an actual theatre. With 1.2 million viewers, the exchange was heated, antagonistic, and widely criticised as a nation watched, as Jerry Hassan put it, two rather similar men in background, age and views, shouting at each other and interrupting each other with little respect for the bigger issues. This staged debate failed to connect with the creativity, innovation and enthusiasm that was demonstrated in the referendum elsewhere. If Salmond and Darling's RCS debate can be considered a stage-managed version of the referendum, the alternative creative responses might be understood as a more progressive, community-based and democratic form of performance. As performance theorist Richard Schechner says, any behaviour, event, action or thing can be studied as performance. And the activity and engagement that occurred in village halls and communities all over Scotland can be productively framed as performative responses to the debate that escalated in the lead up to the vote on the 18th of September. So as well as standard electoral behaviours such as canvassing in public meetings, the referendum provoked a, num a, num a number of other embodied, playful and creative ways of engaging in the debate and performing affiliations via social media. While both campaigns utilised online networks, the Yes campaign had far higher levels of activity than their no counterparts. Community groups posted, uh, posed with Yes signs in various parts of the country, 
We saw people draping themselves in yes banners um, and flags on, top, on tops of hills, by lochs, by the sea, uh, in city centres. Yes badges and t-shirts allowed politics to be literally worn on the sleeve. In Spain, holidaymakers wrote yes in the sand on the beach and posted images of this on social media sites, an alternative or politicised holiday snap demonstrating a political affirmation marked in the land of another nation until a big wave comes along. But elsewhere in Scotland, whole sides of houses were emblazoned with the word yes to attract the attention of passers-by. The buildings were performing the politics of the people who lived there. Yes was written in 20-foot letters on the ground as whole communities gathered and were photographed, an aerial illustration of the number of people who wanted to unite around the, the word and what it promised. Farmers mowed yes in their fields to be seen from a distance, while neighbouring farmers painted no on their sheep and cows. One week before the referendum, over 100 Labour MPs arrived in Glasgow from London to demonstrate their commitment to what was now called the No Thanks campaign. The politicians were accompanied up Buchanan Street by the activist Matt Laggy on a rickshaw playing the Imperial March from Star Wars, while announcing via megaphone People of Glasgow, your imperial masters have arrived. <laughs> this comedic demonisation, and if you've not seen the, um, if you've not seen this, you should definitely watch the video on YouTube. <laughs> um, this comedic demonisation of the visiting politicians demonstrates attitudes towards the enactments of power, dominance, and bias from Westminster. And what should have been a grand gesture from the Labour Party was undercut and subverted by a moment of street performance. Actions such as this are very small and simple and often very playful, but they were happening everywhere. The document of these embodied acts provoked by the political debate and by the desire to find ways of communicating opinion were widely disseminated using Facebook and Twitter as prominent contemporary sites for performances of political discussion and debate. So alongside the smaller scale everyday performances of the referendum, a number of more explicitly theatrical events took place in arts venues across the country. These plays and performances responded to and generated creative and intellectual engagement with the independence debate, frequently demonstrating what might be called early days thinking, imagining a better nation, or speculating on how Scotland might achieve a more progressive politics. At the 2014 Edinburgh Festival Fringe, Various events explicitly tackled the referendum, including David, uh, David Gregg's All Back to Bowie's um, with National Collective, as well as the National Collective Presents events, McBraveheart, The Other Scottish Play, Now's the Hour by Scottish Youth Theatre, uh, McElroy's The British Referendum, and, and many more. On the evening before the referendum, the final performance of Davy Anderson and Gary McNair's How to Choose tour, part of the Early Days Festival, which was a festival that the Arches put on, a, a, a festival of politics throughout the referendum debate. This performance focused less directly on yes and no, instead including perspectives from philosophers, neuroscientists and economists to reflect on human processes of decision making so it was exploring how, how we make decisions, how we choose. Um, and actually the recordings from this performance um, from these, these people are, are on uh, the How to Choose SoundCloud. They're a really interesting document actually of the, of the performance and of the moment. Well, Christine Hamilton points out that many of the artists involved in the debate supported independence and that, and I quote, there was less active engagement by artists who oppose it. Most of the theatre that responded to the referendum avoided an explicit allegiance with either side, apparently so as to hold the issues more open for common uh, continued debate. There are some notable exceptions, however, and uh, Fiona mentioned some of these this morning. In the late David McLennan's uh, contribution, contribution to the NTS Great Yes, No, Don't Know Five Minute Theatre Show, um, he expressed his doubts about what independence could do to change Scotland. In 2013, Tim Price's I'm With The Band used the metaphor of a dispute between four band members from Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland to show how much stronger they were together. 
Conversely, David Heyman's one-man show, The Pitiless Storm by Chris Dolan, and Al Bissett's The Pure, The Dead, The Brilliant, made impassioned cases for independence. Funded by members of the public, Bissett's production drew, grew, drew humorously on Scottish myths and folklore as Bogles, Demons and Selkies, led by a banshee, played by Elaine C. Smith, demonstrated the doom-laden future after a no vote. Uh, Rob Drummond's performance Wallace, uh, which my collaborator David directed, um, positioned itself somewhere between these polemical productions, although it's more easily read as pro rather than anti-independence. While the performances of uh, Wallace were primarily scripted and rehearsed, like many of the artistic events that responded to the referendum, it included an audience debate. Although this was theatrically framed, so in a lot of Drummond's work, uh, the spectators are kind of cast in a role. In this case, they are the audience of a live tea debate, tea, TV debate. But the aim of this is to give the audience a significant <coughs> voice and role within the performance. As playwright David Gregg suggests, the independence debate allows us to explore every aspect of our national life and ask ourselves this question. Does it have to be like this? Perhaps this is why theatre and performance proved so ready and able to respond to the referendum, a phenomenon that persisted right up to and beyond the day of the referendum itself. After a successful run at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, Bissett's The Pure, The Dead and The Brilliant was restaged in Glasgow's Tron Theatre on the evening of the 18th of September while at the other end of Argyle Street, Wallace was being performed at the Arches. The decision of these venues to have these works performed on the night of the referendum made a clear argument for the value of performance in framing, explicating and defining political moments. At the Arches, David watched what he considered to be the most successful and lively performance of Wallace in its week-long run. At the Tron, sitting in the packed auditorium, I found the resonances of Bissett's play took on a heightened sense of meaning and significance due to, um, and due, due to the, the, the fact that it was on the evening. Um, one of the lead performers, Elaine C. Smith, had been a really prominent campaigner um, for the Yes movement, and I'd seen her presenting at various pro-independence um, events, she'd been on the televised debates, um, she'd been at loads of political meetings in the months up to the referendum. So her kind of journey from actress to political spokesperson to on this evening actress again, um, as well as Bissett's impassioned political speech at the end of the performance in which she outlined the continued action and engagement um, that was needed whether it was a yes or no vote. Was anyone there that evening? Yes. <laughs> Um, so what this seemed to do at the end of the performance was kind of blur the boundaries um, between politics and performance. As, as Helen Paris asked, where do we draw the line between art and life itself? At the play's climax of uh, The Pure, The Dead and The Brilliant, the audience were asked to vote using their programmes. So we were asked to publicly re-perform an action that most, uh, probably all, had undertaken earlier in the privacy of the polling booth earlier in the day. Not me, I had a postal vote. Um, as expected, the theatre audience of the Tron said yes, and the atmosphere was electric and jubilant. This enactment of voting within the pure, the dead and the brilliant, and the, the polling that was happening in Wallace um, in the political act, both on this night of the referendum seem to recall the use of the kind of snap polls that followed events such as the Salmon Darling debate at the RCS. The performances of the referendum had particular value in this sense as cultural spaces where the flows of effect on display were oriented less towards measurable outcomes than towards the ongoing process of telling political stories, engaging in political debate, and asking political questions. 
So if I return to this question that I have been asking about the relationship between performance and political events, it's important to have a little look at what's happened since last September. And I was thinking of uh, Robert's question of, you know, um, where's the big art or where's the, the great art? Um, and I feel like actually um, there's, there's, there's been a lot less activity in terms of performance making um, since, the, since the referendum. And in the video that I, I made where I spoke to a lot of artists who were working um, throughout the debate, uh, just a little video I made, Kieran Hurley, who's a friend of mine and a playwright and was very active in the campaign, um, he says, well, the, the great art is not being made now, it'll be made in five years or, <laughs> or 10 years, you know, we're, we're in, a, in a period of reflection. Um, but some work has happened. Um, so there was a performance at the Arches called Howl by Drew Taylor and Julia Dugan. Um, this was on at the Arches in October as part of Glasgow and the Scottish Mental Health Arts and Film Festival. It was performed only a month after the, the vote um, and the performance used Allen Ginsberg, uh, Allen Ginsberg's poem Howl as a frame for considering post-referendum Scotland through poetry, humour, pathos and song. And it included performers who had both voted um, yes and no, for whom the vote was still very raw, to try to work out how Scotland can reconcile or move on after this seismic political event. So in, in this instance, for me, performance felt like a way of, of working through, of trying to understand what happened through art. Uh, and I felt like this kind of mirrored the discursive open spaces that we'd seen prior to the vote. M more recently, on the eve of the general election, Nick Green with Laura Bradshaw and Rosanna Cade performed a performance called Cock and Bull at the Arches. Cock and Bull manipulated the text of uh, speeches from Tory party conferences to create a really intense vocal and physical performance. So watching this excellent performance where three women who began in suits with their hands painted gold, um, they became naked, they were um, defiant, attempting to convey what the artist Green calls the real-time energy of political dissatisfaction and Tory tongue-speak. So on the eve of the general election, once again I was struck by how the relationship between um, large-scale political events and performance can offer a, a heightened and ambiguous space to explore politics through performance. Unfortunately, Cock and Bull felt less like the catharsis that Green was aiming for um, and I read it more like a, a Tory incantation when the, the general election results appeared. So the key elements of these performances that happen on the, on the eve of something, something politically big, um, is something to do with this real-time energy, this liveness, the sense of it happening in a really specific time and the sense of relating the content of the work to the political moment. It feels like it means something. So in identifying some of the ways in which the independence referendum was played out, I, I want to try and capture something of the spirit of the debate in Scotland. I really consider this to have been a, a hugely progressive, creative and formative period in Scottish politics in which theatre and performance played a significant role. Of course, when performance positions itself as political, it's often those who are already interested and engaged with the issues at hand that already agree with the politics of a particular work who will attend it, rather than those whose views might be challenged or reconsidered. Judging by some of the audience responses to The Pure, The Dead and The Brilliant, and indeed to Wallace, and then similarly um, to Cock and Bull, before the general election, the majority of those in attendance at the events had long since firmly decided their allegiance and political stance. The suggestion that theatre can function as a political apparatus might thus be considered limited in this sense. However, the role of professional performance as a site where debate and dialogue could occur 
and where both yes and no positions could be tried on for size during the referendum campaign was really important in confirming and affirming people's views as well as facilitating discussion around the issues. So um, just the comments in the last panel there, you know, are you speaking in an echo, echo chamber? There's also something that's quite galvanizing about having those conversations and then maybe you, maybe you feel more confident about having them out with that space with other people. So as well as these professional performances, the, the types of things that I spoke about earlier, the everyday activities, the conversations in shops and pubs, the wearing of badges and stickers, the mass gatherings that we saw in George Square. These, Schechner argues, we can analyse as performance. For Claire Bishop, the paradox of art is that it's perceived both as too removed from the real world and yet as the only space from which it's possible to experiment. Art must therefore remain, and this is Bishop speaking, art must therefore <coughs> remain autonomous in order to initiate or achieve a model for social change. In this sense, the performances of the referendum had a particular value in creating autonomous relational spaces for people to rehearse and formulate their individual politics, often in a very playful way. The performance and art, art scene in Scotland engaged with and contributed directly um, sorry. <laughs> Yes, sorry. Um, the performance and art scene in Scotland engaged with and contributed directly to a palpable energy and appetite for change and a growing recognition of the possibility of taking the first step to create a more equal society, whether separate from or as part of the United Kingdom. So although a lot of the work that I've described here took place in the kind of final six weeks before the referendum and was, this is the other thing with performance, limited to very, very small audiences, these pieces were a constituent part of a wider social movement, which included performances of opinion across the country and beyond. In its many forms and guises, performances thus offered a space and time for both politicized spectacle and dialogue around political issues. Even the supposedly defunct tradition of town hall meetings reappeared, with such gatherings being heavily attended up and down the country. What remains to be seen is whether this seismic political event will continue to galvanise future political participation. And that's, I suppose that's the question we're asking today. Where are we now, one year on? How will the campaign and its performances be documented and remembered? Will future performative endeavours offer a lens through which to further reflect on the events of the 18th of September? helping us to understand the implications of the referendum outcome. There's much work still to be done in the creative response to the independence debate, and the role of the artist is more important than ever, I think, in helping us reflect and to continue to debate and challenge. Art and performance have a role in framing, explicating and defining political moments. For me, personally, performance functions as a means to understand the world that we live in. And the artistic and creative response to political events are hugely important. The, the real-time energy must be captured, but the deeper and more reflective work will continue to be made for, for many years to come. Thank you. Is there ever any evidence of um, creative performance or even creative debate, debate um, which was organised by the Mosaic? Well, there. I suppose the the problem, or the when I when I have been looking and kind of researching and investigating um, the events, and actually what what I felt like I did most of in the lead up, as as well as. Um, as well as campaigning was, I, I just tried to go and see as much work as possible, everything that I could possibly go and see, and, and I must say predominantly it was very, very much on the yes side. Um, but I think partly that's to do with the lack of a grassroots movement in the no side as well, 
Um, so the No campaign was a very, very negatively um, framed campaign, and um, you know, and, and there's also the argument of um, it's less ex it's it's less easy to get excited about the status quo. Um, but no, there there, there wasn't. Um, there wasn't a huge amount, and, and a lot of the activity that was happening, as I said, the the Archies did this early days referendum festival. It was it was a, a lot of pro independence um, events, but but that doesn't mean that the artists didn't um, vote no. Like you know, as I say, Christine Hamilton sort of says, the, the kind of visible um, the visible artists. Uh, and a lot of performance makers voted yes, but there was also, um, in my institution, you know, a lot of musicians and composers who are voting no. Um, the visual art community, I think, um, was was quite quite quiet actually, comparably. Um, so there was a lot of there was a lot of um, performance makers that were voting yes. And actually, in the little video um, where I'm talking to Alan Bissett, you know, he talks about. The, there was this argument that was made that artists that were voting no felt like they couldn't say that they were voting no. They felt scared, um, and and Bissett kind of doesn't have any he doesn't have any time for this argument because he says you know um, as was proven you know the the majority of, of everything else the media and and everything were were in support of um, of the Better Together campaign. So so actually you know this this argument that the artists were being bullied into into coming out as yes or making work about being yes, he doesn't have any time for that argument at all. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Lady at the back. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, because you picked up on uh, uh, theatre performances that had an overt political thing, but I actually, I went to, for example, the James Place in August at the International Festival, and it was, it felt like a very Scottish audience, and it felt a very, very, I went to the three in the day thing for, you know. So and, uh, seven hours or something? Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was terrific, but, it, and it felt very, very political. It felt like a very engaged audience, and it felt like, it was like a, a, a conversation. It felt like a conversation between the stage and the audience, and I'm not saying it was yes or no, but it was a conversation about politics of state and, uh, and, and power, really. And so I think that kind of looking at what might have been yes performances or ones directly around it doesn't actually necessarily reflect what it was like to be in a public shared space at that time, which didn't actually talk about the referendum, which, but it was actually underpinned by everything that was going on. And I think the, the James plays, you know, which were, were newly commissioned um, plays, which, you know, I, I think the timing absolutely was to, to speak to some of those ideas in a, in a more oblique way, maybe, um, yeah, is, is, a, is, another, is another example of that, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes? How do you interpret the uh, spectacle of the no side struggling to find which flag they wanted long enough they always had the um, Union flag behind them. And then, some months before the referendum, for a very brief space, about a week, they appeared with a subtitle behind them. Then, just before the Commonwealth Games, uh, some relatives from Australia who were queuing up, had double-sided flags put in their hand, Union Jack on one side, subtitle on the other. Then, in that mad week, just before the referendum, I noticed that the Better Together people uh, had a strange symbol. Not the flag, but like a purple heart. Yes. The semiology of flags and symbols was, was so compressed in so few weeks, it appeared absurd. Yes. So they couldn't make up their mind. Yes, I think so. And, you know, that's, uh, I'm, I'm sort of talking about these small things that people were doing to kind of show their politics, you know, writing it on the side of their house and, and these kind of things. But but interestingly, at some of the, you know, at the Commonwealth Games, for example, you know, my understanding is that flags were not, were not, um, saltires were not supposed to be, be used or shown. So there's something interesting, I think, in, in what those what those things are performing as well. In, in fact, the Australian, a relative who told me this had a saltire. She was she was crossing over one of the bridges to the other side of the river, and stewards employed from outside stewarding it said you can't show that flag, yeah. and she was outraged. Mm -hmm. A policeman said 
Stick it up your jaw and take yeah. it to the other side. Yeah. <laughs> but these, these are interesting examples because without having those conversations, you're, you're performing something, you're showing something, aren't you, um, in terms of the choices that you make to, you know, to have a yes badge or to have a flag. So there's, there's something, um, there was something about really visible ways in which people were, and creative ways, you know, I think this is the other thing that was, um, you know, in terms of the lady's point there, it's, it wasn't just, it wasn't just the, the artists that were being creative in this period, it was, you know, it was, um, it was everybody, and I loved having those conversations with people where they say, I'm not political, but, and then they reel off everything that they felt about the, the referendum campaign. For me, it really allowed people to take ownership of politics again, you know, and, and use, start speaking in a way that, that meant politics wasn't just for politicians or, or people who define themselves as activists. It was, it was actually, it, was, it felt for everyone, you know, for everyone to have those conversations, whether you were yes or no. There's a couple of questions here. Yeah, I was just, I guess, they got on the, just a second verse, but they got on the James play again, um, which I, I, I also saw the three, three of them on and uh, enjoyed it uh, with some reservations. But what was, for me, was fascinating, well, in the last one, in the performance that I saw, uh, with the James the uh, was I think the James Place was, was an instance where the, the draft text, the audience was more important in terms of what we're talking about today. Um, because uh, that was a forum where the audience was coming from quite a huge cross section of the middle class as well. And I, I think there was a particular moment in the, in the, towards the end, the, the last one, where I really got a sense of the reaction from the audience of the wrong footing and a real sort of wave of sense of no superiority that came out of the audience. And I knew it was going to be shut up by the drama a little bit later, and it was. And it was a very interesting moment. Because, you know, uh, so, so I think it's, it's all very well to have performance speaking within that echo chamber, is it? Is it? I mean, it, it does serve a certain purpose. But it's not, it's, it's, that's not really what performance is about. Performance should be, it should be something that crosses the whole society and test the audience. Yeah. It's not about the performance, it's about the audience. And actually, I think you've hit on a really important point because, you know, the experience of being in an audience is, you know, it's, it's to experience a, a, a short-term community while you are, are having that experience of watching. So, so I think, um, you know, and in terms of, because as I said, the audiences for performances are incredibly, incredibly, um, incredibly small and actually most of the work that I've talked about today was on at the Arches in Glasgow which is now no longer there um, which makes me feel very anxious about, about where that site for discussion is going to be. So com the audiences are always very small comparatively but they are a different type of engagement and experience than, than other types of um, political events and, and actually that experience of, of sensing a mood in the audience or or something can, can be as important as, as what you're watching, you know. Um, and we, we talk about that a lot in my programme, you know, we're, we're active as audience members, you know, we're, we're active in, in making the meaning of our work. It's not, we don't just sit passively and, um, and watch something and clap at the end, we're, we're active in, in meaning making. 